Lords of War. Chapter 3, The Lion's Gambit. Slim A. Lu Prime. We are as the Emperor made us, weapons, created for this bloody time, and as weapons we can ask nothing more of him than that. Lion L. Johnson. Night had fallen in a forest outside of Richmond, Virginia. In an opening a single figure stood with a large reaper scythe in his hand. Around him were the bodies of monsters either decomposing from poisons or melting from acids, a few had been cut in two or decapitated. The figure stood just short of seven feet and stood in the middle of the opening. He was wearing a tan hooded long sleeve shirt with darker pants on and black combat boots. All of which seemed to be made by hand. The forest around him became still, more so than it was supposed to be. He was silent, watching the trees around him for the slightest signs of movement. His enhanced eyes easily pierced the darkness around him as thought it was daytime. A few leaves were falling here and there but nothing to suggest a creature made them fall. Not seeing much, he tried to listen for anything, for a few moments he heard nothing besides the sound of his acid-based poisons continuing to work on the bodies of the monsters. A few more moments pass, and the sound of tree branches straining under the weight of something. It was coming from nine different trees. The last time a group of people tried to ambush me, it cost them their lives. So, I suggest you show yourself. He said to whatever was in the trees. The sound from the trees seemed to increase ever so slightly. He could make out the sound of human female voices whispering to one another. They lacked the hissing-like tone that the monsters that attacked him had. However, he could detect a slight case of malice and frustration in their tone towards him. Almost like they were looking for something like him but found him instead. The soul of his other stirred inside of him. He sensed something, but not enough to bring it to his attention. I will give you till the count of five to show yourselves, lest I decide to take action. 1. The leaves shifted again and ten young women in silver clothing dropped down from the trees surrounding him. They were armed with bows and arrows as well as hunting knives on their hips, past that they held nothing that would count as armor. They all regarded him in a negative light judging from their facial expression, odd given he had never encountered anything like them before. Though they weren't something that he would call a threat, at least to him they weren't. He knew his reaction time was fast enough to avoid bullets, dodging arrows would prove little challenge for him. Their hunting knives would also prove little threat as his skin had become much harder to cut than your average human. That's if they were to get past his reaper scythe. Boy. One of them called, drawing his attention. We are looking for someone similar to you, come quietly and you will not be harmed. He felt his other stir in his soul. They speak of one of our siblings, find out what they know. If I may ask, what do you mean by being similar to me? Our lady came across a boy of similar height to you, he ran after our lady saved him from death. She had questions for him. And pray tell me, in which direction did this boy go? Jack asked, leaving almost no room for discussion. The girl's face twisted from a discouraged expression to one of fury. She drew her bow and knocked an arrow. Interrupt at me again and you will regret it. If you haven't noticed you are outnumbered and we are more than capable of taking you down. All I see in front of me is a bunch of soon-to-be corpses. Now I will ask again, which direction did this boy go? An arrow whizzes by his head. This is your last chance boy, surrender, or we take you down. He grimaced before pulling a canister from his belt. After pulling the pin he then threw the canister on the ground, in a few moments a cloud of smoke covered the area. The hunters fired their arrows into the smoke, but their arrows missed. The smoke began to spread over the area and soon the area was covered in smoke. The hunters scanned the area looking for their target but the smoke made it nearly impossible to see. Suddenly the sound of a young girl screaming in pain was heard. The hunters tried to find the source of the sound but as soon as they began to home in on the sound another hunter screamed. Soon there was only one left. A hand came up from behind her and covered her mouth. You and I have much to discuss. Talia Grace was not having a great day. Even after escaping from that mansion and finding Annabeth things were still not good. For starters they were running low on supplies meaning they needed to find some soon or find someone who could give them some. 
if needed they could go to Luke's house, but the idea was left at an only if necessary state. The sun was beginning to fall leading the three to seek out refuge in the first abandoned building they could find. The three would happen upon an old run-down church-like building, clearly no one had stepped foot in it for a very long time. The windows were broken and cracked and the greenery grew out of control around the building. The paint had faded long ago and the bricks in its constitution were showing in large patches. The main doors were also broken, with only one hanging loosely from its hinges and the other missing a section. In short it was no five-star hotel, but it was much better than sleeping outside. The three children made their way inside to see how the interior looked. As it turned out not much that different from the outside. Many of the pews were in different stages of decomposition and disrepair the stage was covered in rubble from a collapsed brick wall that created a large mound of bricks. The rugs were blackened and torn up as well as the curtains and there was a hole in the roof. Just then it began to rain, lighting and thunder soon followed. Water began leaking into the main sanctuary, drops of water falling from cracks in the roof. After letting go of a locative sigh the three began to look for a spot that did not have drops of water falling down. A thunderbolt appeared in the sky giving the sanctuary lighting for a few moments, Talia and Annabeth did not pay it any mind. But Luke came to a halt, his eyes locked on the mound of bricks. Seeing their friend stop Talia and Annabeth turned to look at him with wide eyes. However, it was so dark that they could not see anything. Just then another thunderbolt appeared lighting the room once more and allowing the object of Luke's focus to be seen. Sitting on top of the rouble, as if it were a throne, was a hooded giant of a man easily over seven feet tall. His hood was green, and he wore a type of rusted metal plate over cloth, like robe. It gave the appearance of a knight in rusted and mismatched scrap armor. The children, fearing it a monster, drew their weapons and got ready for a fight. As if noticing their presence and hostile intent the hood of the figure moved to face them. There was an aura about him that seemed to turn on when he noticed them. It almost felt wholly as if they were in the presence of a god, but at the same time it also gave out a foreboding feeling like they were being judged. Not knowing what to do the three kneeled and bowed their heads but did not sheath their weapons. Why do you kneel before one you do not know of? The figure asked, his voice harsh and superior. What great deeds have I done to warrant the prostration of children? Annabeth was the first to reply, drawing on the wisdom she always seemed to have. You have an aura of godliness about you. We thought you might be one of the gods, H, the wealthy one from your aura. In Greek legends the gods would often appear to mortals for one reason or another. Do you believe in such gods? He asked Annabeth. The reply was quick. Yes, you see we have been hunted by monsters who have been trying to eat us. We have been trying to survive ever since they began hunting us. Many of the monsters have been from Greek legend. If they exist, then the gods must exist too. She left out the part where she herself was a demigod. What child has the right to sound so knowledgeable of such things? It took a moment for Annabeth to realize he was asking for her name. My name is Annabeth Chase. She replied. The hooded figure looked over to Luke, promoting the boy to speak his name. Luke Castellan. Talia Grace. Talia said when the hooded man turned to look at her. A moment passed before the wooden man spoke. I am named Leon, by my father. No last name? Luke asked, which got him a glare from the two other girls. The hooded figure looked away as if he was looking at someone else. There was a pungent pause in the room before he spoke again. Johnson. Well Mr. Talia started but was cut off by the now named Leon. I am no Mr. and you can get off your knees. They did as they were told and stood to their feet. Leon. Talia tested to see if that would get a response. When none came, she continued on. We're sorry for coming into your home, uninvited, but as Annabeth already said we have nowhere to go. You may stay if you like. Leon said, cutting her off again. Talia was starting to get pissed off, but Luke put a hand on her shoulder to claim her down. Thank you, we will try not to make much noise. Luke replied in Talia's stead. Leon did not reply and continued to sit upon the mound of rubble as if unaware of their presence again. 
Seeing as the conversation was over the three began to set up camp, careful not to make too much noise and ready to stop doing something if Leon raised any objection with which he did not. They soon got a fire going off to the side of the stage seeing as no drops of water were coming down in that area. The fire's light allowed them to get a better view of Leon, however his face still remained shrouded in darkness. Even through the angle of the fire would have revealed his face to them. The three took turns keeping watch, starting with Luke and ending with Talia before repeating. During Talia's watch she found herself looking at Leon for most of the time, trying to figure out who he was, but had no such luck. Leon, however, did not seem to mind being stared at, and Talia did not see him move an inch during any of her watches. With the armor on she could not tell if he was even breathing. Just as her shift was about to end, Talia felt a wave of tiredness come over her. The feeling was so strong that she forgot about keeping watch and closed her eyes. Moments later she was taken off into the land of sleep. She did not wake until the rays of light coming from the sun and the sound of birds singing caused her to open her eyes. Realizing what had happened she shot to her feet and drew her weapon. Luke and Annabeth were still sound asleep, and Leon was still sitting upon the mound of rubble. His face was still shrouded in darkness. He had not moved an inch nor was the rubble round him disturbed in any way. Talia moved over to the other two and woke them. Seeing as it was day, they slowly got up happy to have an uneventful night. They packed up their camp and ate some food they had on hand. Annabeth offered some to Leon, but he did not make a move to acknowledge her. He angered the young girl who did not like being ignored. So, she took it upon herself to get acknowledged and clambered up to the giant man. She was by no means quiet when she was climbing but even with all the noise, she was making Leon made no move. When she managed to reach his leg, Annabeth soon saw just how much smaller she was than him. The young demigoddess touched the side of Leon's armor and gave it a light shake. This got Leon's attention as he looked up before looking down at the girl who touched him. She offered him the granola bar in her hand, to which he accepted to the surprise of everyone there. The granola bars disappeared when it entered Leon's hood, his hood shifted slightly as he ate it. He nodded slightly to show his thanks. Annabeth smiled, taking pride in the fact that she got him to react to her. She slid down the side of the mound and returned to her friends who were watching the exchange take place. To say their nerves were on edge was an understatement. Having gone against monsters for a while now they knew some things were not as they seemed. Well, thanks for letting us stay. Luke said. We will head out now. Leon nodded. The three turned to leave Annabeth was the only one to look back as they left the church. The three made their way through the forest with a little bit more speed than they would have. Truth be told Luke and Talia wanted to get as far away from Leon as possible, that aura he had unsettled them. It took them about an hour before they were far away from the church. It would be impossible for him to follow them now. The three continued on before the sound of something large crushing through the forest caught their ears. They all drew their weapons and got ready for a fight, sure enough the sound got closer and closer until a minotaur wielding a large axe came stomping through the hedges. The monster roared at the three demigods before charging in swinging its axe wildly. The three quickly got out its way before trying to strike at the monster's legs. However, the minotaur turned around using its arm to knock Talia back. The blow knocked the wind out of the demigoddess leaving her dazed on the ground. Luke tried to hit the monster with his own attack but found the back of the minotaur's axe in the side of his head. The blow nearly knocked the demigod unconscious. With two demigods down for the count the minotaur set its sights on Annabeth, who only had a dagger. The minotaur approached the demigoddess and lifted its axe up ready for the killing blow. Annabeth raised up her dagger to block the blow but knew full well that her strength would not be enough. The attack came and the young girl closed her eyes waiting for the end. However the sound of metal meeting metal caused her to open her eyes. A few inches away from her own dagger was the minotaur's axe however it was shaking as if it were trying to push its axe through some unseen force. Suddenly a huge blade began to take shape and it shined with a pale inner light. The blade traveled up a large cross guard, past the hand that held the huge weapon. Leon. Annabeth breathed. Before her Leon stood to her side with his blade in one hand. 
the sword was so massive that it would have been impossible for a normal man to lift it let alone hold it out with one hand. The massive man, who stood taller than the Minotaur itself, stepped towards the beast before backhanded its face. There was an audible crack, the sound of bones breaking under pressure. The Minotaur stumbled back holding its now broken muzzle, blood flowing in between its fingers. The monster was about to let loose a roar when it found an armored fist flying at its face. Leon's fist connected with the monster breaking its neck, however the force behind the punch decapitated the monster sending its head flying back and splattering over a tree. The body of the monster slumped forward before beginning to turn to golden dust. Lone watched the body disappear before he sheathed his weapon. The three looked at him in amazement, to kill a monster so effortlessly was shocking. I had decided. Lone spoke in his commanding voice. That I will travel with you for the time being, I am of no use sitting in a broken church gathering dust. The three looked at each other, normally such a thing would need to be discussed when inviting someone to join them. But they would be foolish to turn down the aid of someone who was able to kill a minotaur so easily. So, they all shared a collective nod, again Leon's face was masked in darkness leaving the three to guess at his reaction. The four would press on wandering the countryside, no real direction but with their new addition things were bound to be easier on them. It took convincing, much convincing and a little help from his other self, but Gabriel managed to convince his parents to let Finn stay with them. They gave him the guest room, but Finn insisted on the rarely used attic, claiming he was more comfortable in dark places. Still having someone around that was going through something similar to him was a comfort. He also had plenty of time to speak with the one called Sanguinius, who was more than happy to speak with him. Sanguinius told him everything he could remember, which boiled down to battle skills and a few memories of his home. He seemed to be more interested in Gabriel's life with the amount of questions he had about life as a semi-normal human being. He also confirmed the theory Gabriel had about his wings, he just had yet to try. Finn also came clean about his past, being the son of a prostitute. He admitted that his mother tried to abort him, but when the doctors tried they were unable to find the fetus. There were a few more attempts but every time the doctors tried, they were unable to find anything. After months no clinic was willing to abort him as he had grown too far. After he was born his mother did not really care for him, other than breastfeeding him when needed he was on his own for most of his life. Because of this his other self wakened very early in his life and began to grow to his current size much sooner than Gabriel had. By the ripe age of six he was already six feet tall. However, he made sure to stay out of sight, even from his mother, but it wasn't like she noticed when he was missing. By age ten was when Conrad Kurz began speaking to him, that was when he began testing his skills out on the local gangs. It began with sneaking around their hideouts, then moved into stealing their money. He even got them to start blaming each other and rival gangs for the disappearance of their money. Five years later he learned how to deploy his war gear. Gabriel asked Sanguinius about his own war gear, to which the angel confirmed he would be able to do the same in time. However, in his current state he would not be able to call them from his soul for some time. There was also the subject of learning the art of war, both with blade and in mind. Since Gabriel has plenty of time on his hands meaning training was going to start very soon. In the meantime Finn would say he would be popping in and out while looking for their other sibling. He said he had a few places to check, but the time needed to get there and come back could be a week so he would be gone for a while. Perhaps an example to follow, after all the internet was a good place to start. If one of his siblings had been seen in public then someone must have snapped a picture. With is this idea in his mind Gabriel took to the internet and began to search. Of course, using words like seven foot tall or giant human did not really narrow it down. Sanguinius lent his aid by providing words that might narrow down the search. However, words like primarch only turned up meanings and officer positions that sounded similar. But he was not going to give up, there had to be something here. That's when he came across an article. A bio-engineer by the name of Sarah Warden worked for a multi-million dollar company Helix, a genetic pharmaceutical company. As it turns out she disappeared 11 years ago, only to be found dead in a house fire along with the bodies of seven mercenaries. A search was conducted for her 12-year-old boy, but the search turned up nothing. 
Three years later the company she worked for suffered a gas breach leaking toxic gases into the office building. Many were able to get out, but the company's CEO was found dead in his office suffocated by the gas. An investigation of the building turned up no signs of foul play, nor was the CEO suspected to be murdered as there were no suspects or probable cause. So, the whole thing was written down as an unfortunate gas leak that would lead to the CEO's death. But something about this did not sit well with Gabriel nor Sanguinius. The angel said he scarcely remembered one of his siblings being a heavy user of toxins and other methods of chemical warfare. However, the Primarch was unable to remember which of his siblings did this, not that he could remember their names anyhow. It was possible that Sarah Warden's son was a host to one of Sanguinius' siblings. However, they would have to find him first. Since this happened two years ago that would make him 17 now meaning he was underage and would be taken in if found. Unless his body began to mutate meaning he would be around 7 feet tall and would be confused for an adult, thus not taken in by the authorities. Even if his identity were to be confirmed, if he did not want to go with someone there was little chance that anyone would be able to make him do anything. Of course, if such a thing happened it would be documented and thus Gabriel would be able to find it. After all, his father had plenty of connections. Gabriel was sure his father would not mind if he wanted to see some documents. Naomi drifted in and out of unconsciousness, that was until something very cold and wet was splashed over her body. The extreme cold forced the hunter into consciousness, she immediately began to shiver as the room was also very cold. Her summer hunter uniform was not helping her keep warm in this temperature. She tried to move but found her hands and feet were held in place by chains. The hunter tried to break out of them with her greater than normal strength, but the chains would not give an inch. After exposing herself she stopped trying and tried to look around for anything that would help her out of this mess. Just as she began to look, the sound of heavy footsteps reached her ears. Walking behind the large crates and boxes in the room was a hooded figure. Slightly shorter than your average giant but still quite imposing. He was still in his clothing from when he took her, his pale green armor. He seemed to be sifting through one of the boxes taking out test tubes and looking at them for a moment before putting them away. He then closed the box and moved towards the front of the room coming into the light. He passed Naomi without a word as if she was not even there. He pulled back a curtain before moving it back into place, seconds later the sound of a door opening echoed throughout the room before I closed. Naomi sat in her chair freezing away until the door opened again about a minute later. The curtain was pulled back and put back into place once he passed. The tall imposing man looked down at Naomi, his hood hiding his face from view. Naomi, in turn, looked back up towards the person who she found to be worse than a creep. As she rolled her wrists around in the chains, she was calculating two things. How much room she had in the cuffs and how to approach this conflict without getting any more restraints. Her lungs filled up slowly with the first exhale, preparing to speak even though she could feel that air collect in her throat rather than her chest. Giving herself only seconds to answer she exhaled with the question. Why am I here? Only so she could get straight to the point, no fluff needed. The large man did not reply, only taking a poorly made iron chair from the side of the room and sitting down in front of her. The chair creaked and groaned under his weight but held firm. The man continued to stare at her for a moment before he spoke. You know where one of my brothers is, or at least where one has been. The gravelly voice of the man spoke. Tell me all you know about him and you will be away from here without any injury. Without knowing, her poker face expression started to turn into a sly grin as she got a command that she was more than prepared to get. Hopefully her grin didn't already give away her response. Why? It's not like I haven't been in this situation before. Usually it's rope instead of chains but nothing I can't handle. She looked as if she was about to laugh before she even finished her sentence leaning forward in the chair to show her tendency to laugh in situations like this but to also test the strength of the chains as they grew colder. The man hummed. A humorous personality, that's good. Means you can bounce back from these things. He stood up and walked over to a box and unfolded a pouch from his belt. In it were a few injectors with a few small test tubes. 
he picked up one with a blue liquid in it and attached it to an injector before returning. You see, my mother, may she rest in peace, was a bio-engineer and was more than happy to share her field of expertise with me. The man explained sitting back down. Then my mentor added to it, but I digress. The man paused. Did you know that humans are social creatures? Some humans can be, yes, but I do know many who love being by themselves. Honestly it is rather interesting as I personally don't mind either. I can be alone, I can be around others, it just depends on the day, time, place, all that sort of stuff. She spoke as if she had all the time in the world, without any sort of threat in front of her. Her hands were held behind her in sort of an oddly calming fashion, her thumb rubbing up against her knuckles to feel for any weak spots, where she could potentially dislocate some part of her hand to wiggle them out of the cuffs. The man hummed again, before leaning forward and smashing her wrist. The sound of breaking bones echoed through the room, followed by her scream. While she was screaming the man jammed the injector into the side of her neck and pulled the trigger. The blue liquid drained from the test tube. Naomi stopped screaming soon after, however her other senses soon followed. Slowly as the feeling grew from her neck downwards and even slower from her neck upwards, her heartbeat quickened almost exponentially. Naomi took deep yet slow breaths before the feeling of pure static almost swallowed her whole, she did not want to find out what would happen if she spoke. She should have kept her mouth shut a lot sooner than she thought. Rob a human of all their senses and they will start to open up to anyone. You will begin to feel this way in a few hours. We shall speak again after those hours. He then stood up and began to leave. Naomi glared at the thing that caused her this pain, or rather lack of. Before shutting the door behind him, he turned to her. See you in a month. Well for you anyways. The door shut and the lights went off.